How does the Holy Spirit move? What's his nature? What are his tendencies? I want to show you seven ways the Holy Spirit moves. The first thing you should know about the Holy Spirit is that he often moves in ways that we wouldn't expect. Number one, the Holy Spirit moves unconventionally. There's a difference between knowing the Holy Spirit's nature and knowing the Holy Spirit's actions. If you only know the Holy Spirit's actions, then your understanding of the Holy Spirit will be limited to those actions. But when you know the nature of the Holy Spirit, then you can see the many ways that He moves. For example, in Genesis 1-2, we see that He hovered like a dove. In Genesis 41-48, we see that He moved through Joseph's dream interpretations. In Exodus chapter 31, verses 1-6, through we see that He brought about expert craftsmanship. In Judges 14-6, He gave supernatural strength to Samson. Matthew 1.18, he caused the word to become flesh. Acts 2, 1 through 4, he arrived as a wind. 1 Corinthians 12, he gives spiritual gifts. Now, notice that none of these actions look anything like the other. For example, if you were to compare Genesis 1-2 to Judges 14.6, the Holy Spirit hovering or brooding, compared to the supernatural giving of strength to Samson, then you might think that they're two different people moving. But in fact, it's the same Holy Spirit moving in different ways. So the Holy Spirit moves unconventionally. Don't limit the Holy Spirit by what He's done in the past. Number two, He's going to move biblically. And this is important to note because the Holy Spirit will never contradict any truth or principle that's firmly established in the scripture. John 14, 26 says, but when the Father sends the advocate as my representative, that is the Holy Spirit, he will teach you everything and will remind you of everything I have told you. Romans 8, 26 through 27 says, and the Holy Spirit helps us in our weakness. For example, we don't know what God wants us to pray for, but the Holy Spirit prays for us with groanings that cannot be expressed in words. And the Father, who knows all hearts, knows what the Spirit is saying. For the Spirit, watch this now, for the Spirit pleads for us believers in harmony with God's own will. God's will will never contradict God's Word. And the Holy Spirit pulls us toward the divine destiny that God has for us. The Holy Spirit prays for us. The Holy Spirit moves us. The Holy Spirit inclines us toward the will of God. So that's number two. The Holy Spirit will always move biblically. Just because He moves unconventionally, sometimes He does different actions. Sometimes what He does today doesn't look like what He did yesterday. He will always bind himself to the Word of God, he will never contradict it. Number three, the Holy Spirit moves powerfully. When the Holy Spirit moves, there is true transformation. He's not just putting on a show. When the Holy Spirit moves, people are healed, delivered, saved, changed into the image of Christ. 2 Corinthians 3.17 says, For the Lord is the Spirit. And wherever the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Luke 4.18 says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, for He has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim that captives will be released, that the blind will see, that the oppressed will be set free. Notice here that there is action to the move of the Holy Spirit. Notice here that there is freedom when the Holy Spirit moves. When the Holy Spirit moves... He moves powerfully. Number four, the Holy Spirit moves mysteriously. Now, sometimes we miss the way the Holy Spirit is moving because we're not discerning. We're not paying attention. It doesn't always make sense what the Holy Spirit does. John 3, 8 says, The wind blows wherever it wants, just as you can hear the wind, but can't tell where it comes from or where it is going. So you can't explain how people are born of the Spirit. 1 Corinthians 2, 14 through 15. But people who aren't spiritual can't receive these truths from God's Spirit. It all sounds foolish to them and they can't understand it. For only those who are spiritual 
can understand what the Spirit means. Those who are spiritual can evaluate all things, but they themselves cannot be evaluated by others. The Holy Spirit and those who love the Holy Spirit are often misunderstood because there's a mystery to Him. There's a mystery to the way the Holy Spirit moves. You're not always going to understand everything that He does. You won't always be able to wrap your mind around what the Holy Spirit is doing. Sometimes what the Holy Spirit does will offend the intellect. It will confound the wise. For God chooses the foolish things. Don't expect to always understand what the Holy Spirit is doing when He's moving. So, so far we've seen The Holy Spirit, number one, moves unconventionally. In other words, He moves in ways we wouldn't expect. Number two, He moves biblically. Though He moves in ways we wouldn't expect, He will never contradict the Word. Number three, He moves powerfully. He's not just putting on a show. He has actual effect on people and regions. Number four, He moves mysteriously. Don't expect that everything the Holy Spirit does will make sense to you. Number five, He will move gracefully. There's an elegance to the way the Holy Spirit moves. Luke 3, 21 through 22 says, One day when the crowds were being baptized, Jesus himself was baptized. As he was praying, the heavens opened, and the Holy Spirit in bodily form descended on him like a dove. And a voice from heaven said, You are my dearly loved Son, and you bring me great joy. Notice here that the Holy Spirit descended in bodily form like a dove. A dove represents grace. A dove represents purity and gentleness and innocence. The Holy Spirit took on the form of a dove, demonstrating that there is a grace to His moving. He moves gracefully and powerfully, gracefully and mysteriously. And no, these aren't contradictions. You know, when the Holy Spirit begins to move, people begin to criticize that move of the Holy Spirit. Religious people often point to a move of the Holy Spirit and say, no, God is a God of order. Or they'll say, no, the Holy Spirit gives us self-control and this doesn't look like self-control to me. And what they're actually doing, though it may sound clever, is they are putting their personal preferences before the move of the Holy Spirit. Yes, God is a God of order, but whose order? Yes, God is a God of self-control, who gives us self-control. But that doesn't mean that the Holy Spirit won't disrupt our agendas. That doesn't mean that we're always going to like the way He moves. What it does mean is that there is always a grace to the way the Holy Spirit moves. There's an elegance about the way He moves. He's classy, He's elegant, He's graceful, He's a gentleman, He is the dove of heaven. The Holy Spirit doesn't make you senseless and silly, He makes you spiritually sharp. Number six, the Holy Spirit moves timely. He moves just on time, His time. His timing has such perfection, and sometimes that can be a little frustrating. You've likely heard the phrase, he's never early, he's never late, he's always on time. Now, being in the flesh, sometimes we'd rather that he arrives a little early so that we can settle our fears, but God challenges our faith because the Holy Spirit moves in his perfect timing. Acts 2, 1 through 4 says, On the day of Pentecost, all the believers were meeting together in one place suddenly, There was a sound from heaven like the roaring of a mighty windstorm, and it filled the house where they were sitting. Then what looked like flames or tongues of fire appeared and settled on each of them, and everyone present was filled with the Holy Spirit and began speaking in other languages as the Holy Spirit gave them this ability. Now, what actually happened here in Acts 2 came about as a result of the disciples waiting in obedience to the command that Christ had given to them. Jesus told the disciples to wait. He said, wait for the coming of the Holy Spirit. Gather together and wait upon the Holy Spirit. And those who are spirit-filled, those who are spirit-led, those who are friends of the Holy Spirit know that sometimes you have to wait on the move of the Holy Spirit. Yes, we should be about our Father's business. Yes, we should be engaged in evangelism. We should be revival in the earth. But there are certain things that only the Holy Spirit can do 
and he will do in his timing. But there's a suddenly to his moving. You see, there's a waiting on the Spirit. And in that season of waiting, God is testing your patience and your faith. He's stretching you and He's helping you mature. And then there's the suddenly, like in Acts 2. When you obey Jesus in the waiting, there will be a suddenly of the Spirit. And the Holy Spirit came upon them suddenly. A sound from heaven was heard like the roaring of a mighty wind. And suddenly the Holy Spirit moved. When you wait upon the Lord, the Holy Spirit will show up suddenly. They had been waiting because Jesus told them to wait, and that's when the Holy Ghost showed up. That's what He does. When we patiently wait on the Holy Spirit, He moves in His perfect timing. So, so far we see the Holy Spirit moves unconventionally. He moves biblically. He moves powerfully, mysteriously, gracefully, and timely. Number seven, and please don't misunderstand this. I'm going to explain this in just a moment. Number seven, he moves inconveniently. And what I mean by that is he's not going to move based upon your preferences or timing. You often hear people crying out for a move of the Holy Spirit. God, give us an outpouring. God, give us revival. But what many believers fail to recognize is that when the Holy Spirit begins to move, that's actually when we become the busiest. We work the harvest field, but it is work. Ministry is work. Serving God is work. Though it's a joy, though it's a privilege, it is work. And when revival comes, it'll cost you something. People want to move of the Holy Spirit. They want revival. Are they really looking forward to gathering every day with the believers? Because that's a mark of revival. Are they really willing to give themselves to evangelism? Are they really willing to drop everything and go and do what God has told them to do? In many cases, that's not so. But when the Holy Spirit moves, He will demand your time. When the Holy Spirit moves, there will be sacrifice involved. When the Holy Spirit moves, there will be something that you have to place on the altar to keep that fire burning. Acts chapter 16, verses 6 through 8. Next, Paul and Silas traveled to the area of Phrygia and Galatia because the Holy Spirit had prevented them from preaching the word in the province of Asia at that time. Then coming to the borders of Mycenae, they headed north for the province of Bithynia. But again, the Spirit of Jesus did not allow them to go there. So instead, they went on through Mycenae to the seaport of Troas. Notice here that Paul and Silas had an agenda. They had a plan. They had their own purpose. They had something set in their heart. They were going to go somewhere, and then the Holy Spirit said, no. When the Holy Spirit begins to move, some of the things that you wanted to do won't be done. And some of the things that you didn't want to do, He'll ask you to do. The Holy Spirit, yes, moves inconveniently. Now, this does not mean that He moves disorderly or harmfully. I'm not saying that He hurts His children. What I'm saying is that when He moves, sometimes that will be a challenge to your agenda, to your plans, to your dreams, and you'll have to lay them at the altar. The Holy Spirit moves unconventionally. He's not always going to move in the way that you expect. He moves biblically. He will never contradict the Scriptures. He moves powerfully. Things actually change when He moves. He moves mysteriously. Sometimes we can miss Him if we're not paying attention. He moves gracefully. There's an elegance to the way He moves. He moves timely, meaning he arrives just on time and he does things just when they're supposed to be done, whether we like it or not. And he moves, number seven, inconveniently. A move of the Holy Spirit will cost you something at some point if you want to keep that fire burning. Now let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we are asking for a move of the Holy Spirit, no matter what it costs us. I want you to pray that right now. Ask him for a move of his spirit in your life, in your ministry, in your region, in your city, in your nation. Father, pour out your spirit. We're so hungry for you. And we pray, Lord, that you would use our lives. Help us to recognize when you're moving. We call upon the name of Jesus, asking for a fresh touch of the Holy Spirit. Move as you will. Precious Holy Spirit, we love you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. I want you to say it because you believe it. Say, amen. Here now is a question for conversation. What do you love most about when the Holy Spirit moves? 
Let me know in the comment section. Now, don't forget to subscribe if you're watching us on YouTube and click that notification bell when you do. You can also follow us wherever you're watching us. Now, I want to read a portion of scripture to you found in 2 Corinthians chapter 9. And I want to challenge you here and I want to challenge you to step out in faith. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, I'm going to begin reading at verse number 6. Remember this, a farmer who plants only a few seeds will get a small crop. But the one who plants generously will get a generous crop. Paul the Apostle here is talking about finances. You must each decide in your heart how much to give. And don't give reluctantly or in response to pressure, for God loves a person who gives cheerfully. Now watch this wonderful promise. This is powerful. And God will generously provide all you need. Then you will always, not sometimes, have everything, not some things, that you need. And plenty left over to share with others. That's one of my favorite parts right there. Plenty left over to share with others. God wants to bless you and make you a blessing. How do you align yourself with this promise? You become a giver to the gospel. This is biblical truth. Every Christian should give financially to the gospel. When you plant seeds, you're planting seeds for a harvest. When you plant seeds, you're planting for souls. We want to see souls saved. And we don't give to be blessed, but the scripture makes it clear that God will provide everything that you need. When you're a giver to the gospel, he meets your need and then makes you a blessing to others. So I want to challenge you to step out in faith here. Some of you are walking in a season of abundance. Some of you are walking in a challenging time. Whatever your situation looks like financially, this promise is yours if you are a giver to the gospel and you will receive in proportion to how you give. That's the scripture. That's the biblical truth. That is absolute truth. It's the reality of what we believe. Now, if you believe the Bible, then you know that you can depend on this promise. So I'm going to challenge you now. Step out in faith. Do something generous for the Lord, not for me, for the Lord. You may give through this ministry, but you give to the Lord. Give generously to the gospel. Give a one-time gift by going to davidhernandezministries.com slash donate or become a monthly partner by going to davidhernandezministries.com slash partner. Some of you will even be led to do both. Your support helps this ministry to fund the live streams, the media, the Holy Spirit School, the events that we do around the world, and we don't charge for any of those things. It's all donor-supported. People like you with generous hearts who are blessed by what we do and who believe in what we do, give to the gospel. Go to davidhernandezministries.com slash donate to give a one-time gift or slash partner to become a monthly supporter. Do that today, and we thank you for your generous support. Thank you for standing behind us. It means the world. Here are some comments from a previous video titled, How to Finally Be Free from Guilt and Move On With Your Life. Gracia Yui writes, So blessed, I'm feeling guilty for the sin I committed yesterday. Praise God I saw this. God bless you. Paula McKeva writes, Wow, this is powerful. Thank you for the encouragement to focus ahead, not behind. Che Lee writes, Brother David, as you were speaking, God was talking to me through you about my guilt and shame. I love Jesus with all my heart, but often think of my past sins. Thank God for using you to talk to me about moving on after God has forgiven me. And the final comment I'll read from this video comes from S. Melody, who writes, I needed this. I kept letting guilt get to me, but I felt so much better when I repented and let God take the will. Thank you and God bless you. May the Lord bless you and keep you in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. And until next time, remember, nothing is impossible with God. Thank you for watching Encounter TV. Don't forget to subscribe and click the notification bell. Also, help us spread the gospel of Jesus Christ in the power of the Holy Spirit. Make a one-time donation or become a monthly supporter by clicking on the donate link now.